Dos Savage here. I'm in Mumbai right now, managed to escape that disgusting sub-zero weather we were having in London. I think it was minus seven when I left, but I'm in, in 30 degrees right now at my grandma's house. I've been meaning to make this video for a while. I tried to make it the first day I came and then the mozzies kind of went to town on, on my face. I didn't wear any mosquito cream and then expected mosquitoes to not be mosquitoes. So I guess jokes on me. And then I tried to record the second day that I was here and my mum and my grandma we just chatting in the background. My grandma kept coming in, like offering us fruit and stuff. And I was just like, okay, I'm not going to record this. <laughs> so. <laughs> we're, we're here now, day four, I think it might be. And I just wanted to talk about failure in research because I'm on the cusp, I think, of having my first published paper. I had a bit of time to reflect while I'm here in India on the research experiences that I've had so far and what I've learned from them. When we think of success in research, it's usually that there's something tangible, like you have a research paper, at least like a blog post or a video or something like that that you can put out. But there's more undefined things that you gain from learning and like learning to deal with the uncertainty of research that aren't well laid out. And now when I look back on a lot of the research experiences I've had that I initially viewed as failure, I think I actually learned quite a lot from them. And so I wanted to lay that out in the hopes that it might be helpful for some other future researchers or just an interesting thing to hear about. So I want to start off with 2019 summer, which is when I did my first research based project. I had really gotten interested in biology that second year of my, my uni. Exams hadn't gone great. I tried a failed startup with one of my close friends from school. Didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew I still really enjoyed this academic thing. Joined the Synthetic Biology Society. I'd done a bioinformatics hackathon, which didn't go great, but I did it. Had gotten interested in AI. I was emailing professors around Imperial for potential projects I could do on biomedical statistics, phylogenetics, that kind of thing. And eventually a supervisor called Sam took me on. Amazing supervisor, like really helped me out when I didn't really know too much. We were working on a spatial statistics project. so looking at Gaussian processes. Sam had spotted this error in a uh, old paper, like from the 70s or something, from this very well-known figure in the field called Brian Ripley. And we were trying to diagnose that problem better, understand it better, try and remedy it. I was helping out in the understanding part of that, looking at some math stuff. And uh, like I said, my maths exams hadn't gone well before, but I was super into the maths for this project for some reason. I just got really into differential geometry, was learning about it. And it was so much more engaging to me than doing my exams. We kind of wrote up, the results were looking good, plan was to complete it. And then this spiky little protein thing happened and the pandemic happened and Sam's an epidemiologist. So it, it basically meant that this project got put on hold indefinitely. It was a bit annoying at the time because I was like, oh fuck, I'm, this was like the, meant to be the main project and whatever. But I thought about it a bit more like, it was the first time I'd done a project that I was really, really invested in and enjoyed. And so regardless of the fact that there was no paper at the end of it, didn't really matter too much. Like I knew that this research thing was something I could do again. And so when it came around to my undergrad thesis, which is my third year of uni now, I spent a lot of time researching potential projects I would do. And I narrowed it down to medical imaging. And then I went to go talk to the medical imaging professor Elsa about this. And she had seen that I'd done this bioinformatics hackathon before, and she offered me a new project. She offered me like this transcriptomics project, which is where you're looking at the activity levels of different genes. And I was like, yeah, screw it, why not? Let's let's do that. I was looking at this cancer called DLBCL. It was an interesting project, super interesting to be honest. The data set was really, really good. I enjoyed my experiences towards the end of it once I got more used to the coding, but I was out of my depth. Like I hadn't, as I said before again, like I hadn't done as well in my exams, hadn't really coded as much as I should have. And when it came to doing that project, I struggled a lot with getting to grips with coding. I got there eventually. I started even to enjoy it almost at the end when it wasn't quite crunch time. But yeah, it was it was a bit of a slog. It was a bit of a slog. And I, when I look back on it now, I was like, if I knew the coding stuff that I know now, I would have like smashed that project so easily. But it just wasn't the right time. And by the end of the project, it wasn't really clear what we could actually write up from it. And so we kind of shelved that project, let it go. The course of that project though, I had interacted a lot with biologists and with a clinician or two and realized that they were, I was just sort of speaking a different language with them at times. And so it would be good for me to go learn more about biology, about medicine. To be honest, when you learn more about biology and how complex it is, it's kind of surprising that anything in medicine even works. So I was like, I need to go learn more about this stuff if I really want to work in this field. Like I can't just come at it from a technical maths Komsky perspective. I have to come at it from the biology medical perspective as well. So. I went and did a master's in precision medicine. My aim here was to get as broad a coverage of how AI could help precision medicine. So I spent a lot of time thinking about where I could learn the most about 
a random area of medicine I hadn't touched before. And so I ended up settling on medicinal chemistry and there were no projects being offered initially in that topic. So I really went out my way with a project proposal, found a supervisor from the machine learning department at UCL, the Gatsby lab, and was like, yeah, I really want to do some work on this topic. Super interesting to me because it was working with graph neural networks, equivariant graph neural networks, where you're looking at graphs that are in 3D space. And that's to look at molecules. And I was looking at how one molecule becomes another molecule, how the reactant becomes the product and trying to use equivariant graph neural networks to do that prediction. It was an interesting project. It was still kind of very far removed from actual medical work when I think more about it now. And I was so out of my depth with computational chemistry. I haven't done chemistry since, or biology since um, GCSE, but I was just trying to learn as much as possible. I kind of knew what I was getting into, but I also kind of didn't. I managed to get it done, but it was a lot of work. And I remember thinking like, would I have gained more by just doing something more similar to what I'd done before? Like one of my past projects, continuing one of those in some, some regard in terms of the techniques of the data type? Would I have gained more taking on a project that was just easier, that was more like scopable, or that had already been proposed rather than going out of my way and proposing one? But it was all, all a learning experience because then from that point I was like, okay, you were out your depth in a couple of projects, let's just pick something that you know you can do. So I picked a project in multi-omics, which is we went from transcriptomics in my undergrad to now doing multi-omics, so I'm looking at all the other types of molecular data you can get, proteomics, proteins, metabolomics, metabolites, genomics, looking at DNA. I knew that I wanted to make that a focus, but then another curveball comes through, which is that I didn't get my data for the first year. And my aim was to publish in my first year. Like I was really set on that. Reasons out of my control, out of my supervisor's control. It's just tough to get data for some things and it was kind of siloed up. Other shit happens. What are you gonna do? At this point, I'd kind of gone through the stage of like reflecting after finishing the project. I was like, okay, I've got to adapt. I've got to figure out something else to do. And so fortunately my other supervisor who had done some NLP work, biomedical NLP work, so I started working on that. I started looking at test data sets from online that I can use. I remember reading this thing that Feynman, Richard Feynman had said about, basically he just had a list of methods that whenever he got presented with new data, he would just try all of those methods. And at some point, one of them is gonna hit. And that's the way I was looking at this, like think of loads of methods, get loads of data sets, keep trying stuff, eventually something will stick. And then when you get your proper data, hopefully one of them will translate to that as well. Going through this made me realize there was a lot I'd actually learned when I was failing in these projects. And I wanted to share some of those lessons. So from the very first one, I still learned that I love doing research and I wanted to keep doing research. From the second failure, I began to understand how complex biomedicine actually was. And I also learned how to code properly for research projects. With the third project that I did on my masters, I learned how efficient my learning process was when presented with a completely new topic and narrowed down what I wanted to do long term, which ended up being my PhD in omics. The issues that I have had during the PhD have all taught me about learning to adapt on the spot, learning to keep developing methods, finding other data sets online, that kind of thing, just to make sure you're constantly working on stuff and also the importance of doing collaborations with not just your supervisors, but with other people as well to make sure that projects are constantly ongoing. And I've distilled a lot of that down into what I think is like a useful path for new researchers once they come into the field. I think the first thing is that you need to have clear initial goals for the project. The whole point of research is that it's uncertain, you're discovering new things ideally, and so it's gonna be messy, there's gonna be uncertainty, goalposts will change, that's the nature of the beast. But you still need to have clear initial goals so that you have some trajectory. You're gonna probably have to readjust them, but that initial plan is what allows you to keep iterating on something, and that's pretty useful. The second thing is having a clear understanding of what you're good at, what you can bring to the project, what you need to learn for the project, and learning how efficient your learning process is, because that's gonna let you know how much time is really gonna be required, and whether that fits into the time frame you have, or whether you need to scale back your involvement in the project. The third thing is then to just do the work, get your work to be as good as it can be within the time frame, and if there's more time, then do it better. You're not trying to be a perfectionist, just do it to the best ability you can. Just get that tangible output, the result, the main thing you need to get done, done, and that will be enough. The fourth thing is to understand that failure is, is inevitable, it happens, and so what helps is to take on lots of projects once you have more experience of one. It's hard to know the amount of projects to take on and the amount of involvement you want to have in each project. I think that's something that you've got to figure out from just getting more experience, and so I would say, is about going end to end in a research project. So 
if you haven't done research before, just try and pick a super simple project and just go end to end. Like do everything, do the coding, do the write up, do the presentation to other people. And at that point, you kind of know what, what's required to actually get a research project done. Then you can go figure out what level of involvement you want to have in different projects and try and collaborate with other people. And then you have clear goals. And so you know when you've done a good enough amount of work, then you can stop. And then if there's more time, you can do more, you can do better. You gotta grind as hard as you can in the time you've got, but you can't really expect more than that if you really wanna get shit done. It's tough to get that right. I've learned how to set my expectations more reasonably as well. And one thing I think of a lot is something I've seen content creators say, which is this thing called the taste gap, where you've gotten into YouTube or making music or whatever because you listen to music or you've watched YouTubers that you like a lot and they're working at a high level. You start making stuff and your technical ability isn't there yet. And you're like, why is there this huge taste gap between what I want to make and what I'm currently making? There's no real solution other than you just have to keep getting your technical skills higher and setting your expectations lower and eventually you hit that point and maybe you can even get to there. I'm, I'm kind of on my way to getting that average right now. Again, the only way it's done is through experience. I wish there were a simpler answer, but I've only learned through experience and that's kind of what I'm recommending. Hopefully that's useful for someone.